Greetings, ladies and men gents, and welcome to this latest iteration of the web series, The Nature of Predators. If you're new to the series, there is a playlist listed down below in the description. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 167 Memory Transcription Subject, Onzo, Yodel Technical Specialist. Date, Standardized Human Time, March 24, 2137. Malfleet crested towards the waiting enemies, with the greatest tools and allies mankind had been able to assemble. As impressive as Earth's wartime innovations had been, it was their relentless pursuit of friends that we'd reaped the most rewards from so far. Having others to back us up made it possible to challenge a multitude of foes. The road to reach Arthur's orbit hadn't been pretty, but war never was beautiful or clean. The Terrans hadn't escaped entirely free from compromising their beliefs or sacrificing lives that they wished they didn't have to. Assuming that we gained orbital control, I wasn't sure about what we'd do about the Dirtian's determination to glass this world. My grim realization was that humanity might have to bend their values again, with the Gaussians sending up civilian ships amid the battle. The evacuation shuttles hadn't lowered their thrusters despite the oncoming onslaught. The United Nations hadn't fired on the transports, though we were in range to take first ones out. I could see weapons growing antsy the nearer they got. The Terran Allied fleet seeded a slight opening, altering our path enough to drift out of the way. With thousands of weaponless refugee vehicles coasting ahead, it was difficult to steer clear of all of them. I eyed the sensor readout and noticed them sending power to directional thrusters. The evac shuttles must be trying to sidestep us, sir. But if they are afraid enough of Terrans to leave, why would they trust them to not fire? My head snapped towards Tyler. Get weapons and fire on those shuttles. They're hostiles. Hang on. What evidence do you have of that, Anzo? The human asked, the wary voice. I know you think they deserve to be wiped out, but... The evidence is they're not acting afraid of you. None of them are flinching. My gut instinct says that they're up to no good. The Gaussians have been better understanding of what's the truth about us. They might know our code of ethics against shooting civilians. The shadow cast knows, but the average citizen doesn't. That means that the secret fleet must be piloting those shuttles. It's the only thing that explains their behavior. Sensors would know if they'd be hiding weapons, so that... No. My God! Captain Monaghan frowned, having overheard our exchange. That's a bold assumption, but it has a ring of truth to it. Weapons. Patch us in with our allies. Advise them to hold their fire, but shoot any transports that draw too close. As comms fired off a hasty communique, I passed along the nearest shuttle for weapons to target. The speediest Kolshin transport swerved at a UN drone. The automated vessel was programmed not to shoot the civilian targets without authorization to clear hostile activity. When the evac ship rammed into the unpiloted vehicle at full speed, it smoked through its hull. Both space craft were shattered in the collision. Hundreds of life signatures from within the shuttle vanished in an instant, strewn to cosmic dust. On the thousands of ships carrying refugees, similar passenger counts showed on my readout. Given the lack of panic movement from within the interiors, I assumed that they had no idea what their fate was going to be. The civilian vessels turned on the first Terran ships they could encounter, with several hundred crashing before we'd reacted to the unthinkable. I could feel a knot of horror in my stomach as I realized how little the Commonwealth thought of the lives of their own people. While humanity chose to care about all life in the galaxy, the Gaultians cared for none. Those civilians had been loaded onto the shuttles without a clue of their fate, with a promise of escaping the system. The Shadow Fleet knew that we wouldn't shoot a genuine transport down, and conned hundreds of thousands of their citizens into climbing aboard to make it believable. They waited to start evacuations until the last minute because they intended to use innocent lives as weapons. How will they ever explain this to their people? How do military commanders, at least the ones from the Republic Fleet, have no gripe with the strategy? Captain Monaghan's teeth were bared with contempt. Shoot down every one of those transports and sensors from now on. Don't mark any Kolshin ships as non-combatants. Understood, ma'am, I replied, filters to label anything with Kolshin warp signature as hostile. If there were any innocents, their government deranged actions had revoked their right to protection. The transports are shown as hostiles now. I've left a new class indicated to reflect their unarmed status, so weapons can fully assess our priorities. Good work, Anzo, Tyler grumbled, through a gaze that was far off, struggling to process such a senseless gambit of civilian lives. You were right. After what they've done to the entire planet, I guess this shouldn't surprise me. This time, it's not just them letting it happen, like they did with the Thafki or the attacks on Nishtal and the Cradle. 
This is intentionally and knowingly sending civilians to their deaths. How did they sell this to the people outside the conspiracy? If I know one thing about the Federation, it's that they love to blame predators for anything that they have to do. Better dead than cattle. Wants to sacrifice a few thousand ships if it saves a herd. Yet our empathy is what's under the microscope. That's a bad fecking punchline, huh? It's not a punchline if it's not the least bit funny. It ain't funny, but it sure is a joke. We could've had hundreds of friends if the Federation didn't exist. I'd sure like to see what kind of shake we would've gotten. Like, it's a wonderful life, except that it's a good thing they weren't around. Once again, I don't understand a word you're saying. That's how I feel with you and your science words. Forget my movie references, and put that big brain of yours to work. We gotta get Baldy and company within range of the moon. I'm working on it. We're needing to pass through the Shadow Fleet while ahead, slated to mark contact in a few minutes, after we clear out the civilian transports. The human nodded. The eyes on the Dominion's main activities? They're on the offensive, gunning for the shield and SC when they can, since they get off on hunting prey, but I don't think that's our primary concern. It's not. Keep at it, buddy. The Terran warship slides through the remaining transports like buddy. The shuttle's lack of shields or armor allowed them to be downed with relative ease. The Colchian's ghastly trick had taken out a few hundred ships before the first shots rang out, but I knew our true casualties would surface once we engaged in enormous armada. I angled the viewport towards the moon where the planetary defenses sat, which was dulling out carnage with any lasers that landed. It was difficult to imagine Sovlin in a back suit, traipsing around. The rovers dropping to the ground were the only way he'd keep up with the persistent predator's track. Their mission could entail heavy resistance, so the more we could simplify the landing process, the better. While our manned ships were pigeonholed into closing in on the moon in order to unload infantry, other contests were being waged across the planet's breadth, flashes of orange and white signifying explosions and plasma, respectively, detonated above the world's entire circumference. Speedy UN drones on this side of Alpha were targeted by the planetary defenses from Alpha. Meanwhile, from the globe's opposite half, missiles blazed into space from the depths of the ocean. It lent credence to the theory that the Colchians had constructions within the abyssal waters. These warheads appeared to be nuclear armed and their ability to escape the atmosphere and find targets was an impressive feat of engineering. I'm sure they didn't stuff those missiles onto one side of the planet's oceans and not the other. Now stay vigilant for anything at the atmospheric fringes on our side. We don't want to get blindsided by nukes. The Terrans had a better capacity to thwart the ballistic missiles lobbed at singular ships, although such mighty munitions packed a forceful punch even if they stopped short of the target. The Yodel Technocracy also possessed particle beams that could slice through the warhead's arming mechanisms. However, Chief Hunter Ilthus' craft got walloped by an influx of nuclear weapons. It was clear the Dominion ships had been ordered to pay no mind to defense. What was fortunate was that the Sapien Coalition and Durgin Shield were kept on our side of the globe, or else they might have fell victim just like Ilthus had. Our Dominion allies were reduced to a small remaining force, cutting off one source of manpower. So, I know I said that it's not our primary concern, but I don't think that we want our herbivorous allies to take a shellacking like Ilthus, I remarked. Can they handle Ox or fighting them one-on-one -on -one or uh, two-on-one? Tyler bobbed his shoulders. I doubt it. But we can't worry about that until the planetary defenses are offline. Hopefully the Greys aren't ready for Prey to actually fight back. The Dirtian are out of, for blood, so hopefully that compensates for their lack of tactics. I suppose they're lucky they're fighting Ox or not Shadow Fleet ships. We're the ones who are pitted up against the biggest threat, and the sole path to the moon is through them. The human tapped to mark radius of space. I input the region that we need to get to for troop deployment, per the mission parameters. Worry about finding us the best route and keeping us appraised of any threats. Might be a bumpy ride, you know. Understood. I also know that we want to be as close as possible, so I'll look for anything that helps us gain ground. Our warships were joined by some UN drone support, since our manned vessels were at a disadvantage against caution automatons. The laser on the moon amped up their firing speed, putting an exclusive focus on our newest and strongest craft. Outdated crewed vehicles were neglected altogether. The amount of power that could be funneled through the lunar installment was astounding, similar to how humans moved their nuclear arsenal to Luna. The Commonwealth had stationed some of their high-yield explosives on the natural satellite. 
That kept them closer to the action in the event of a raid, rather than buried in the ocean. Our flight path wasn't as similar to Kalsum's en route to Earth. I wondered if the Caltians had taken notes from that clash. It didn't seem that the Shadow Fleet had grasped our intentions, since they were regarding the UN drones as the greatest threat. Our highest concentrations of automatons found shield breakers deposited in their midst, and were tag-teamed by ship weapons and planetary defenses. And Terran vessels were able to cruise forward with minimal fire trained on us. Thousands of soldier-toting friendly sailed towards the arbitrary boundary where our troops could deploy. It was only when we neared the skirmish line that our foes rounded on us, and plasma began zipping our way. I could see debris littering the edges of the viewport, a telltale sign of why thousands of our drones had vanished from senses. If our finest vessels are getting mowed down by these planetary defenses, I see why we need to capture the and eliminate the infrastructure. Imagine how the Durchin shield would fare against weapons of this kind. This must be why the Kulshians thought Alpha was impenetrable. Navigations yanked our ship to one side, turning our casual glide into a spiral to avoid plasma. Shields blinked out on my readout, with the Shadow Fleet having ample shield busters in reserve to handle us. I pinpointed a Kulshian automaton for a weapon targeting, but its algorithms were one step ahead of our hastily deployed shot. The beam fell wide by a large margin. Charging ahead against the superior craft wasn't ideal, yet the threshold we needed to reach sat behind these vessels. Our own drones had to break free of the predicament and give us an assist, or we were going to end up in multiple pieces. I could see several man craft flanking us, reduced to tattered husks. I traced a vector towards a marginal opening in their ranks. This is the best opening I can find, but it takes us within their direct line of fire. My suggested strategy would be to set up barriers and hunker down, except that time is of the essence. The Gaultians will close the gaps as soon as we make a run for it, won't they? Tyler sighed. Obviously. They don't know our true plans, but they don't want anyone getting in range of the planetary defenses. How? Even if we did get past them, we'll have lasers and nukes from that moon thrown in our face. Need to launch the troops and get out fast. Why haven't they used the nukes? Probably going to wait to launch them. In the event that we get past their line, they don't want the Shadow Fleet caught up in the blast radius. Layers of defense. So we need a distraction. We've got a few spacecraft carriers. Time for him to open up their bellies and pester the squids with some fighters. Back where it all began. I twitched my ears. It's a start, but we need more. If we have any antimatter bombs left after the gas giant fight, I think it's time that we use them against the singular ships. It'll punch an opening and give us a moment to break through. We do got some leftover warheads. Don't got any intention of dropping those on Arthur, especially after Monaghan's little chat. So throwing them at the Colchian's face sounds fantabulous to me. I'll bring the captain in the loop. I locked in on the optimal vector for our navigations before offering a second set of targets that needed to be displaced. On the viewport, munitions was past us. Standard combat missiles were locked on Terran ships by the thousands. Weapons were working over time to strike the explosions down before they reached us. Though one rammed straight into our nose, without shields, it blew off the large chunk of our underbelly. Though, thankfully, it was shy of the hangar where our troops were congregated. We were fortunate the hull integrity held together, and that the fissures in our armor plating were not spreading throughout the vessel. Non-critical hit. Might lessen the power that we can route to the railgun, but it could be much worse. We don't want to get hit by anything else lobbed our way. Tyler gave me a nod as he returned from the captain's station, signaling her approval of my plan. Com sent out the call for fighter support. It was rare to utilize such massive munitions in fleet confrontations, since their design was tailored to targeting sprawling regions from orbit. We prepared to divert all power to thrusters. There would be a single chance to make a break for it, assuming our plan worked. I watched as we bore down on the cautions with some level of concern for our safety. Inertial dampeners were suffering the occasional lapse, pushed to the hardware's limits by our erratic maneuvers. The disadvantage of having biological life on board was that we couldn't take severe evasion action like drones without killing the occupants. I could see the bubble of space nearing on sensors, but despite the strategic advantage, I wasn't going to suggest that we push deeper to give our friends a better launch point. It would already be perilous to get their jetpacks in range at all. Fighters slingshotted out into space from our behemoth carriers, who lurched at the back of the pack. That was step one of the distraction, 
as nimble UN frames weaved up close and nipped at the Colchian's heels. Now bombing classes were preparing the deployment of antimatter weapons, ready to forcefully evacuate the enemy from this patch of space. Humanity was too stubborn to turn back. We were pushing through to the target destination, here and now. Plasma clipped the already damaged part of our ship as our jerky movements failed to skirt a close-range beam entirely. I moved closer to Tyler on instinct, drawing strength from having my buddy at my side. We'd always known that deployment to Alpha was a risk, but standing by him was worth sacrificing the idyllic future that beckoned me on Lian. If those antimatter bombs didn't get out of the Allied base soon, we were going to be lit up like a sacrifice to Ralchi. Kinetics raked across the front of our ship, mauling us even further. Navigation was overloaded with new threats, desperately dipping down and throwing out interceptors. There was no time to get our bearings and counter the inbound munitions, as we felt the ship rattle from impact after impact. Hey, uh, Tyler, I hissed. If this is our last thing I say, I've got three words I picked out. Feck the Federation. The blonde human ruffled my forehead fur, earning his hiss from him. Damn straight. But I don't plan on dying none. We gotta rescue Slinek, promised Marcel, onward and upward. My quizzical look intensified as I questioned whether that exclamation was in reference to the hot air balloons. There were worse things to die thinking about than Terran flight devices, and the technical chain of events that led them to the natural development of starships. A lot of people would have sought something more meaningful to dwell on, but I want to go out fantasizing about what I loved. The red dots on the screen indicating threats faded into the background. I waited for the inevitable, even as the primates fought tooth and nail to press ahead. Instead of getting bulldozed by two plasma beams, our warship managed to turn on its axis. We glided between two searing arcs that were meant to ensnare us. My optimism for our prospects lifted ever so slightly as the antimatter bombs began to unload from across our fleet. Hostile drones bulked with the city-leveling munitions incoming, and tried to maneuver out of the way. Their plan was to let each missile sail past, where it would be locked onto nothing and could be disabled at their leisure. However, another wave of human warheads chased them along their evacuation route, forcing them to widen the gap further. A third volley kept them back so that we could pass unassailed, like wild beasts being fended off by a waving torch. The antimatter did connect with a handful of enemy targets, mainly those who lost mobility earlier in the battle. Massive levels of energy were thrown out from the epicenter, and I had to hurriedly account for the plane of shrapnel which was generated in our path. The edge of the launch point was a few seconds out, so Sovlin, Carlos, and Sam could leap to the moon if we got a little further. You had fighters and drones mobilized in a circle around us, standing between the manned vessels and the shadow fleet. They were taking the brunt of the barrage, buying precious seconds, which must have tipped the Colchians to our importance. However, it was too late for the Shadow Fleet to stop us from executing our plans. The region where we were cleared to space drop troops flashed green as the censored dot of our warship poked its nose across the boundary. Without an instant's hesitation, the hangar bay was flung open and human soldiers left from the safety of our vessel to get boots on their lunar ground. End of chapter. I would just like to thank our T5 members, Lord Azrakal, Ambrose Cattell, Quantum Wednesday, Dregzoon WRE, Blueberry Cat, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Bushmaster 177, and Leslie 517. Thank you very much.